I like to snowboard. I love powder. And whenever there's a powder day, I want to go up and just ride. And then a few years back, we finally got our first smartphones. And now I can actually really go up and ride. And no client would ever know that I was up riding and answering that email up there, taking that perfect powder run. And then I went to New York after that perfect powder run and met a friend of mine a few years back. He also received his first smartphone and said, I hate this thing. My clients know where I am at all times. They can reach me all the time. So again, it's about perception. It's about the context. It's about how you use the technology. I loved it. He hated it. Picked up surfing. <laughs> love the elements. Really love the elements. And I had to learn to read the elements because they can be very dangerous, but also very, very pleasing. And reading the, danger, reading the elements, actually, is very important when you play golf. Because you have to read that green to get that putt in, so your short game is actually going places. For those of you who are golfers, can probably understand that sentiment of really having to go and practice until you hit that perfect swing. It takes forever. And I'm realizing that all these three sports I'm really very passionate about have two things in common. They use highly specialized equipment, and we constantly have to wear also highly specialized garments. And by being able to network our garments and receive data, we can actually understand wind patterns. I, I know when low and high tide are coming in. I understand wind speed. I understand my temperature. I can actually avoid avalanche-prone areas because I understand where the sun actually hits the slope, and I'm avoiding these spaces. So technology enables me to augment my senses, and I find that freedom very beautiful. And then I have to go back to New York. And in New York in the summertime, it's hot and steamy and humid. You're sweaty. I sort of always want to look pretty chic. Um, and then I have to take the subway. And the subway is cold. You almost walk into a freezer. It's dry. It's drafty. Some people next to you definitely have a cold. And... Uh, it's the perfect breathing ground to get actually sick. Well, why can't we design garments that protect me from actually getting sweaty, make me feel comfortable at all times, understand temperature settings, understand my body temperature, the ambient temperature, and my perfect temperature, and evaluate and change their settings accordingly? So create a very functional item of garment that dough is extremely aesthetic and stylish. So I need those two parameters. I want to be functional, and I want to be, of course, beautiful. Now, what I want to do is put Silicon Alley in New York City, which is the Silicon Valley of the city, and the garment industry, the fashion district, together, and create this nexus between silicon and style. And the way we do this, um, I work with a team where we envision to create computational fashion. And what we're building right now is technology that is integrated into what we wear every day, our clothing. And the way we do this is actually we're taking components that are in a little black box in your cell phone or into any little wearable gadget you maybe wear right now, take these components, make them even smaller, make them more flexible, make them use less energy, make them wireless, <coughs> coat them so we can waterproof them, and put them on a flexible substrate, like a textile. And then we can take that substrate, that piece of technology, and integrate it into anything we wear. So how are we doing this? We're using the skin as a metaphor. So 
the human skin tans. It's my first organ. It's huge in terms of its sensing and actuating capabilities. So it's basically sensing light. It tans. Hair stand up, pores opening, et cetera, et cetera. Then I'm correlating that and talking about the aesthetic layer, what I actually wear as a textile. And that textile has not only the properties of one to cover me, but also is a social identifier. Because we always want to belong to a posse, as a snowboarder, that's very often the case. But then also we have this invisible layer, so we have a layer underneath the actual skin, which very often now is used for implants. And then we have another layer, and that is that layer which I refer to as the identity layer. It's that layer between the actual organ, the actual skin itself, the epidermis, and our textile, our second skin. And that is the layer of bacteria. And that bacteria is invisible. We don't see it, but it is actually a large part of our human identity. So this project you see here is by the artist Sonia Boimel, who collects bacteria, quote-unquote, by walking through the city of Vienna, then puts herself onto a life-size Petri dish, lets the bacteria grow for a few days, and that's what you see. So my question is, can we use that bacteria that is constantly changing and not really hackable as uh, the basis for data security? And using all these four layers, I, of course, want to augment our senses and What we need to do in order to do that is we need to create an object. So we are creating these textiles. But my question, because I'm very interested in nature and I don't really want to harm nature, can we make those components biodegradable? Can we actually synthetically program biology for our purposes? There are a few other things on this list, energy harvesting, material science, those are all properties that are extremely important for the actual physical object itself. And then we go to the intangible, the data. But in order to make sense of all the data, we need to contextualize it. And in order to contextualize this, we need a lot of computational power, and thus, Quantum computing as a next generation in computation is definitely important and required and necessary. Imagine every single piece of garment you wear is connected and gathers data. And then all of us in the room have the same. Let's say I have 10 pieces of garments on me right now and I want to collect certain parts of data. I'm a little bit nervous, so my heart rate might go up. Um, I'm dehydrated because I just flew in from New York. So there are lots of different parameters I want to measure and I want to sort of understand. But if we all do this, we need to have computational power that currently far exceeds what is available. And then, of course, we need to put this intangible data together with the actual physical object in order to create an innovation, something that we can actually use. And that requires a lot of design thinking. And in order to do that, I picked one particular thing, and that is interaction. Now, my question is, what if now my textile has all these computational powers, is a sensor, is an actuator, How do I actually interact with it? How do I interact with a garment that is actually my computer? And with all this design, and with all these opportunities we have, in terms of new manufacturing techniques, we heard about 3D printing. 
new ways to actually think about the maintaining of a garment that is a computer? What about a digital tailor, a digital cobbler? We actually are able to augment our senses. And we can use these techniques in order to create these new garments, these new textiles that have meaningful applications and are very meaningful for me because I need to master still some of those elements. And I need technology to help me to do that in order to achieve that freedom I want to go up and ride when there is a powder day. To me, that is the beauty of the augmented second skin. Thank you. <laughs>